All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Reese. I'm the president of the IT division for uh, FIA, and I wanted to welcome you all to this IT-sponsored event. Um, we have uh, one heck of a panel up and ready today. Um, it's an interesting opportunity to be able to have so much talent and so many distinguished uh, experts in our field in, in one place at one time uh, with a guy like John moderating the, uh, this entire uh, process. So uh, thank you for coming. As you can probably tell if you've been to IT events before, um, this is a really good turnout, perhaps the largest we've ever had. So uh, again, I'm not sure if that's the bar in the back or if it's the talent in the front, but either way, um, we're going to go ahead and, and take it and, and move on. So um, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. I apologize, I'm standing in front, but a quick introduction of our speakers uh, and our moderator. Um, none of which really need uh, uh, introduction, but uh, uh, just to briefly spin through. Uh, John Lothian, uh, as you all know, is the president and CEO of uh, John L. Lothian and Company. Uh, and again, as you know, the publisher of the John Lothian newsletter. Um, also the founder of MarketsWiki.com and MarketsReformWiki.com. Uh, and most recently, the newest venture, which if you haven't seen, absolutely go out and check it out, is MarketsWiki.tv, uh, which is a video-based um, uh, kind of depository of, of industry information, experts talking about that information moving through. So again, John, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we also have Richard Gorlick, the Chief Executive Officer of RGM Advisors. Uh, we have Peter Nabik, the Chief Technology Officer of Alston Trading. We have Don Wilson, founder and CEO of DRW Trading Group, as well as Dean Payton, the Managing Director and Deputy Chief Regulatory Officer at the uh, Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange CME Group. So um, with that, a warm welcome. And uh, John, take it away. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to tell you a quick Matt Reese story uh, before we start, though. Uh, Matt was one of our first participants in the Markets Wiki Questions Exploring Financial Technology video series that we're doing that's on uh, MarketsWiki.tv. And uh, we interviewed him out uh, next to the Board of Trade building. And the first question was, what's the single greatest opportunity in financial technology today? And he said, well, there's really two things. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to get, uh, get started here. The format is going to be uh, quite simple. What we are going to do is we are going to um, go through a bunch of slides here uh, that include quotes and excerpts from some news stories that uh, have been in various publications um, saying things about high frequency trading and what it is and, and maybe what it isn't. And, uh, and so we are going to ask our panel here to, uh, to tell us what they think of these, uh, tell us what's right, what's wrong, um, what's funny, what's sad, what's ironic, um, whatever, and, uh, and, and see what we can uh, find out about uh, the much misunderstood concept of high frequency trading. Um, so we have Richard Gorlick, um, RGM advisors. Guess what? He, part, he's part of the RGM. Uh, I got the DRW. I can figure that one out myself. But where do you get Alston Trading? What, uh, just to kind of explain that to start. It's uh, where the Harvard Business School is located. The Harvard uh, Business. Alston, Massachusetts. OK. <laughs> All right. So there you go. All right. So let's take a, take a look at uh, our, our first slide up here. And uh, the question is, does high frequency trading cause wild stock market swings? OK? Um, now, these guys, I don't know if you have the slides in front of you or not, but the quote is, since high frequency trading does better than the market's slower movers when volatility is high, it's hard to swallow the claim that it actually reduces volatility. Instead, its trading creates more momentum that slower traders are forced to respond to, which is precisely what leads to bigger price swings. And this was from uh, the Atlantic Monthly Group. Um, Rich, does high frequency trading cause high uh, price swings or does it mute price swings? What's, what do you think? Spent a lot of time over the last year or so as these claims started to build in popularity looking at the data. Because while I had logic on my hands, you know, logic always said to me that you couldn't both create volatility 
and profit from volatility, that you can't uh, both push a stock or a futures contract or some kind of financial instrument away from its fair value and make money doing that. You really have to push it towards fair value. That's what sort of the logic behind why I never thought that high frequency trading could contribute to volatility, but spent a lot of time saying, okay, that makes sense, but let's look at the data. And over the last couple years, there have probably been a dozen different studies that have come out of exactly this question, which is what is the role of automated trading or high frequency trading in every paper, every study, terms it a little bit differently on volatility. And without exception, they all concluded that high frequency trading either had no impact on volatility or actually dampened volatility in the market. So I think both the logic and the evidence are pretty clear cut that high frequency trading is sort of beneficial to the markets in terms of dampening these wild swings. So um, what, kind of, what kind of strategies are we talking about that encompass high frequency trading I, I mean what's bringing us back to the to the norms um, or are there momentum high frequency trading strategies that are trying to to get slower people to react you know are we trying to gun for the stops so that you know that we can uh, that we can take advantage of you know the traditional things that a pit trading community might be trying to do yeah, I'm not going to pretend to know what every trader out there does, and probably any market's got lots of different people trying to do lots of different things at any particular moment. But the great thing about competition in a market, you know, where you really have everyone out there looking at figuring out ways to profit, is if someone pushes the price away from fair value, that's an opportunity for every other firm in the market to identify that it swung too far and is about to swing back and to trade in that direction and push it back towards fair value. So I think the general my view is that logically uh, that type of strategy is not s sustainably profitable. You may get lucky every once in a while, but it's nothing to build a business on. Okay. Um, Peter, what, without divulging any great secrets, what are some basic concepts for high frequency trading strategies that, that you have seen in the marketplace? Uh, yeah, I, I think before going into that, it's important to remember or to highlight what you just said with strategies with a plural. Um, I think one of the most important things to know about high frequency trading is it is a business strategy or part of a business strategy, not an independent single trading strategy. Um, high frequency trading is, is made possible by some of the low latency work that's been going on in the markets um, and, and relies on that, but it's not one single strategy. Um, so when you hear about the high frequency trading market makers, well, we're not always you know, market making, if you hear about the spreading, it's not always spreading, it's not always momentum. It's just like pit trading or over the phone trading, any of the call around stuff, that it's a means of execution upon which many, many strategies are layered. Um, now, some of the most prevalent ones are market making, um, but I think of it as more of a, a general or looser term of market making. Like I've, uh, I've seen studies where they say, well, people aren't always on both sides of the book all the time and they say they're making a market. Well. They might be making a market in a synthetic spread they've created. So they are on both sides of that spread, but it's not in the same market. It's not in the same central order book. Um, or you'll hear about, uh, I heard about uh, you know, high frequency trading. They say they're market making, but they're also taking the market. Well, of course market makers sometimes take the market. If your position limits get hit, if you're losing money and you need to dump a trade, you don't dump that trade by making a market. You get out of it by taking the market. Uh, or if you're getting off a hedge from making a market in another uh, contract, then you, know, you can get that hedge by, by resting and making a market in your hedge contract. But sometimes that market's going away. And I mean, everybody who's in the business of trading knows if you need to get a trade off and the market's going away, you take what's there while you can. So I think it's a, it's a variety of strategies. So Don, did you invent any special sauce for high frequency trading that that you know is unique to uh, computer-based trading that you couldn't, you know, that wasn't existing in some form in a, in a trading pit, or or are the or the trading strategies that we've seen, you know, in a pit or across markets, are are is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really I don't really think of high frequency trading as a whole new strategy. Um, I think of it as you know, low latency, 
um, capabilities as just opening up the possibility of trading uh, in a new time frame, but very much you know, thinking about doing the t same types of things that you might do in a pit. You know, buying something that you think is relatively cheap and selling something that you think is relatively expensive. Um, and, you know, obviously if you're standing in a pit, you have, you, uh, it takes a little bit longer because you have to, you know, write your trade down on a card. Um, you know, when I stood in the pit at times, the market got really, you know, really busy, and I got behind writing up my trades on the cards, and and um, so I guess that I was doing high frequency trading in the pit. I find you um, for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dean. Um, and um, uh, but but no, I I don't really see it as a as a new thing. It's it's just uh, um, just a new new way of doing an old thing. Okay. So, Dean, um, one of the claims uh, that uh, we've heard about high-frequency trading that kind of relates to this wild swings um, is that uh, high-frequency traders are front-running orders. Okay? Um, I mean, first off, I don't see any of these guys in the brokerage business or with customer business to be able to have knowledge of any customer orders. Um, and any order that's exposed to the marketplace um, is exposed exposed to the marketplace, and, and you know, so how where's the misperception that this is somehow front running? I think there's a couple things. I mean, some of that uh, arguably comes from some of the issues that we had in the security side of the business, where they allowed flash orders. So there were certain participants who would. Uh, receive information before the broader market. But when you talk about the futures industry and you look at, say, CME Group's market model, I mean, all that information goes out at the same time to every participant. They all get exactly the same, uh, the same information. So there really isn't any uh, potential advantage for individuals to get information about customer orders that would allow them to front run those orders. I think the other part uh, that that uh, statement takes into account is there are people who believe, you know, that algorithmic traders look to detect uh, buying interest or selling interest and that they'll try to front run that buying interest or selling interest. But obviously this is a marketplace, right? Information is reflected in the marketplace. That information is public information and to the extent that people have a view as to which way the market's going to go based on public information, that's not, you know, that's not an issue that we should be concerned about from a market fairness perspective. So I was a runner on the trading floor one summer and, and uh, we had a run up in the grain prices and it was really easy to tell that it was going to happen because there was a really long line getting into the soybean buy broker. and you know, not so long of a line into the soybean cell broker, you know. Yep. So, um, I mean, now traders in the pit were able to see that. The, the, the whole wide world was not necessarily able to see that. Are our markets in an electronic age where this information is distributed broadly, you know, to anybody that can see it, is that more fair than, say, you know, a, a pit situation like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's unquestionably true, right? I mean, there's substantially broader access to the markets. They're fully transparent. Everything's anonymous that takes place on the screen. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a completely different environment. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Is high-speed trade, uh, computer trading killing investing? Okay, high-speed computer trading by funds with holding periods of sometimes just milliseconds are to blame for rising volatility the disappearance of diversification and the death of individual stock picking and the problem is going to get worse, say a number of traders and market strategists. That's a CNBC interview where you know everything that you hear is always true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Don, um, let's, start, let's start there. Um, is it high speed trading by funds? First off, is there, are there, are there, is this funds that are doing these uh, high frequency trading? 
I mean, I, I'm sure there are some, some hedge funds that do, uh, that employ high frequency trading strategies, um, but, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the latency sensitive strategies are employed by, by, uh, uh, you know, people who are not managing other people's money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so principal traders, um, so there's a, here's a misperception that it's hedge funds that are doing this. Some hedge funds certainly, uh, I'm sure you're right, are, are, are involved. Um, how about the, the death of individual stock picking? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, just taking a step back and, and you know, as far as the, you know, they are to blame for re rising volatility. Um, you know, I, I like to take a step back and, and kind of look at the big picture. And obviously, we're in a period of heightened uncertainty. Um, you know, we don't know if the economy is going to recover or go into a double dip recession. We don't know if we're going to a period of deflation or very high inflation. We don't, you know, we know that there are very high levels of sovereign debt, and we know that there are big problems in Europe. And, and I mean, this isn't the, the kind of permanent state of the world, right? We have much greater uncertainty now, much wider, uh, you know, much wider divergences in views of, of what might happen. Um, and, and I think that that uncertainty, um, combined with a higher risk aversion are things that lead to um, greater volatility. Um, you know, one of the other things that, that we're seeing um, is that there, there seems to be um, a reduction, you know, greater risk aversion and a reduction of risk capital. Now, I mean, that's not a surprise. The Dodd-Frank legislation says that banks should stop doing proprietary trading. So, so our government decided that, that we should have less risk capital out there in the marketplace. So the combination of great, greater uncertainty, higher levels of risk aversion, and less risk capital, um, I, I don't think it's at all shocking that there's greater volatility in the marketplace. I'm a little confused how, you know, how one would conclude that high frequency trading is what's causing the greater volatility. Uh, it seems more logical to me that there's a bunch of other issues out there that are uh, causing greater volatility. I love the, uh, the concept of the death of uh, individual stock picking when you, when you look at you know, eras of stocks where they, they didn't make new highs for you know, 25 or 30 years, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and there's lots of different things that, that influence, uh, influence all of that. Um, yeah, so the, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a tech bubble, you know, retro thing to blame, you know, in, the death of individual stock picking on this thing that's, that's happened. Yeah, Jeff, on that point, I mean, I think what they're referring to is this idea that correlations have gone up a lot during this recent period of volatility and over the last few years. And I think it's this idea that, wow, you, you know, it must be the high frequency traders who are somehow driving correlations up. I think that's also a little bit misguided for the very same reasons that Don talked about. When the major drivers of value of these assets that are being traded are macroeconomic in nature, when it's whether or not they're going to be sovereign defaults, whether we're going into another recession, this massive macroeconomic un uncertainty, you would also just expect logically that when the big drivers are not single stock related but macroeconomic related, that you would have higher correlation. Um, and we've always seen that during periods of volatility, you have higher correlation. So I think this is just a reflection of sort of how markets work and what you'd expect to occur in a market that's functioning well, rather than some indication that there's something wrong. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I think my colleagues gave uh, better answers, but I'd like to go to the obvious too on this. And that's when your holding period of a stock is a millisecond, it has almost no impact, I'm talking like six zeros and then maybe a one to the right of the decimal impact on somebody who's holding a position for more than a day. Like, um, uh, getting into and out of one stock in a millisecond or two or five uh, does not impact somebody who's picking a stock for long-term gains over a, over a six-month period or a year period. Actually, it probably benefits them, right? I mean, you know, building on what 
Richard said earlier, right, these folks are providing liquidity to the marketplace. And, you know, to the extent that that liquidity isn't there, the volatility is going to be greater. I mean, there's always going to be supply and demand imbalances in the marketplace that, you know, as Peter and Richard said, that's what markets are about. But if you don't have liquidity, right, that volatility is a lot greater. These people are the ones who are providing substantial liquidity to the marketplace. So I have a question. What percentage of the dividend do you get when you hold it for a millisecond? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I would also add, and I think everyone has different strategies. I think, you know, Peter puts that up. But my sense is, is that the vast majority of high-frequency trading strategies, people often talk about holding periods of milliseconds. I really, that's not how I think about the bulk of the strategies. I think most of the strategies, maybe they can respond to information in the market in milliseconds, get orders into the market, and hear back from the exchanges in milliseconds. But typically, you know, this is just an evolution of professional trading that we had in the pits, that we've had in other markets for years and years. They're short holding times. You're going to turn over positions multiple times during the day. It's that frequency that I think is high when I, you know, try to define high frequency trading. But more typically, holding periods will be many seconds or minutes or in less liquid assets longer than that. Um, but, you know, rather there's not that many trades that I think can be done, with, you know, in and out of the same instrument in no, you know, instantaneously. Right. What what percentage of high frequency trading do you think is uh, day trading that's closed out, you know, by the end of the the session? It's hard for me to know what other firms are doing, um, I, but uh, but I'd have to say the vast majority of it. Um, with, when you are operating on such a uh, on such tight. It, so most low latency, high frequency trading operates on very low margin. Like you're making very little money on every trade. And I always hear you're making tons of money. You're making money on every trade. Well, no, you lose a lot too. It balances out to an average of a very little amount on every trade and that's on really good days. Um, and when you're doing that, the cost of holding position overnight really impacts your profitability. So a lot of it is not being held overnight. And, and that that is, is usually hedged in another position and you're making use of some sort of cross margining account. You guys agree with that? I, I, at DRW, we actually, I, I mean, latency sensitive trading is, is one part of what we do. We also have traditional liquidity providing businesses, and then we have some businesses that are more focused on risk taking. Um, and, and to, you know, to me, there's kind of a, you know, a blend across time frames. Um, so, you know, some of our businesses, we use latency sensitive tools, and yet, you know, that helps us get into positions that are, you know, more risk-taking positions that we may plan on keeping on for, for weeks. Um, now, I mean, that's certainly not the majority of the kind of latency-sensitive volume, um, but it's tough to uh, uh, just put a blanket statement over the whole thing. Okay. I mean, one of the arguments uh, that's been made is that a lot of high-frequency trading is uh, day oriented and that that tends to have a balancing effect on it that you can't say that it ran prices one way when they had to also get out because you've got to have somebody that's going to let you out of, out of the trade you know so yeah I mean I think that's right I think that the vast majority of high frequency trading on a, measured on an intraday period is buying as much as it is selling during any particular time frame it's also hard given that to understand how it could be responsible for long term price movements. Um, it could be responsible for, uh, you know, very short-term price movements, but if you're buying as much as selling, you know, if you're getting blamed when things go down, you should also be given credit when they go back up. Okay. All right, so our next one is bank stocks abandoned by robots again. The high-frequency traders have again drunk their fill of the precious life force of the bank stocks and have tossed their shells to the bone-strewn ground. <laughs> No hyperbole there, nothing, <laughs> nothing to comment on. Um, first off, since when did the bank stocks have life force? <laughs> um, I don't know, this is kind of uh, that, that other area about uh, being predatory um, that we, we, we talked about in, the, in, our, in our conference call. So there's the volatility issue, does it cause volatility? But is high frequency trading um, predatory. Um, 
I don't know, Dean, from a, an exchange standpoint, do you see anything that's predatory about high frequency trading? Well, I, I think, first of all, in the context of this slide, right, I mean, obviously the, the banks created their own kryptonite, right? I mean, market fundamentals were what was driving bank stocks uh, throughout this period. So, I mean, when you, when you talk about are people opportunistic, you know, when they perceive that, you know, a particular stock is fragile, uh, yeah, I think that's called price discovery, right? I mean, people are making determinations about the value of a particular stock, and as Richard pointed out, if that stock moves too far, you've got Don and Peter here who are going to recognize that anomaly and bring it right back into line. So, I mean, I, I think it's, again, it's, it's the way markets work. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on this slide? This is one of my favorite slides because I have absolutely no idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do think it sort of fundamentally gets to the question of, you know, how are prices set in a market? And it comes back to, in my mind, you know, competition as being the key feature of what helps it determine these prices. If you um, take a market without a lot of competition, if we were all colluding, or if it was one firm that was controlling all the trading in a particular stock, um, then it's a little bit more conceivable that the price, you know, that we might have some control over the price. But really, our job is to respond to the market dynamics, to try and take all the information um, that's publicly available and form an opinion on fair value and trade towards that value. It's not to decide that, well, we're going to really take Bank of America for a ride today and, you know, drive the price down. That's really not how the markets work. The markets wouldn't let us do that even if that was something we wanted to do. Well, and it is hyper competitive, right? I mean, yeah. these folks are extraordinarily competitive. And if you compare that to, you know, say a pit traded environment where there is competition, but, you know, everything is manual and out in the open, these are automated strategies, right? They're not, you know, really taking into account you know, what the guy next to them is doing. They're responding to uh, the information that's in the marketplace and available to everybody. I uh, moderated a panel out in New York a couple of years for uh, Deutsche Bank, and, and it was kind of their investment bankers that did the technology stuff. And in and, and dealing with the investment bankers, they were a completely different breed. They were like, you know, I don't feel right going home unless I know I've done a good job and, you know, destroyed my competition's day. Kind of thing. Do you guys uh, do you guys feel good? Do you, can you even tell that you you destroyed you know uh, the competition uh, somehow? Or you know, is is there any way to to know what they're doing? At least for us, it's kind of an informational vacuum in terms. I mean, we we all talk, we know each other, but at three thirty and at the end of the day, I look at our profitability. I don't look at my competitors' profitability. I don't look at other market participants' profitability, and I have to feel good about our profitability based on how we did in the market that day, not on how we did in the market that day compared to someone else. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. The next slide. No to higher frequency flash crash. It is high time we had a definitive verdict from the securities watchdogs on whether the unholy alliance between these traders and managers of exchanges, Dean, that's you, <laughs> and trading platforms acts as a stealth tax on ordinary institutional and retail investors. So first off, is there an unholy alliance, Dean, between traders and, and uh, and the exchange? Well, I, I certainly think that there is an alliance between the traders and the exchanges. Obviously, the exchanges, right, in servicing their customers sell liquidity. High frequency traders provide that liquidity to the marketplace. So, you know, from that standpoint, there's certainly an alliance. But, you know, the concept or the idea that that constitutes a tax on other market participants, I mean, it's actually the opposite is true, right? It's a benefit to other market participants we get uh, tighter spreads, more depth, lower cost, greater operational efficiency. I mean, uh, you know, people benefit from liquid markets. And to the extent that high frequency traders have been shown to uh, provide liquidity to the marketplace, I mean, it's a benefit. 
Richard, um, this is John Plender of the Financial Times. I mean, this is not a fly-by-night, you know, newspaper here, and he's a pretty big name and is a financial uh, columnist. How could how could somebody like that get this so wrong? What what are what are we doing wrong that that you know there's so many in the press that don't understand what high frequency trading is and and what it does? Well, clearly there's a lot of misconceptions you know in the public and in the media and even among policymakers about how markets work and what it is that firms like ours do in the markets every day. But I was even I was surprised as you are at seeing something like this in the Financial Times. Um, as recently as it was. A couple years ago, I think that was sort of a, a reasonable question that people were asking, which is they're looking around, it's after the, you know, immediately after the financial crisis, people suddenly wake up to this realization that there are these things called high-frequency traders out there. It was sort of new to a lot of people. Um, and while firms like ours have been around for a number of years before then, I, my firm was founded in 2001. I think a lot of the larger firms in the area were sort of, in, were from that era. Um, People took a hard look at it for the first time in the public, the general public, back right after the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, in that era. And I think the first question that people ask is, wow, there are all these people, I don't know who they are, um, I don't know what they're doing, I, wonder, I hear they're making money, I wonder if they're making that money on the backs of investors. Are they really, you know, is it costing investors money? And I think that, answer, that has been almost definitively answered as no, it's actually very good for investors. There have been so many studies of not only what has happened to transaction costs across the board, about how transaction costs for retail investors or institutional investors or commercial hedgers in the futures markets, how those have come down so dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years as markets have become more automated and more competitive. But they've also been another whole bunch of other studies that went in and looked and saw what was the role of high frequency traders in making these markets less expensive and came back very favorably that both the competition and the efficiency brought about by automation was really beneficial in lowering costs. So I think, um, as Dean says, it's really the opposite of what the suspicion here is. And that even the, you know, the, the more modern, up-to-date uh, critics of high-frequency trading who are just sort of suspicious generally and have uh, feelings that something's wrong, even I think those critics generally concede that transaction costs have come way down and that market structure and the participants in those markets have gone a long way to contributing to that improvement. Okay.